But If Our Love Be Dying by Michael Field Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Barr But if our love be dying, let it die, As the rose shedding secretly, Or as a noble music's pause. Let it move rhythmic as the laws Of the sea's ebb, or the sun's ritual, When sovereignly he dies, Then let a mourner rise, And three times call upon our love and the long echoes fall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The City in the Sea by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org By The Snake Lo! Death has reared himself a throne In a strange city lying alone Far down within the dim west Where the good and the bad and the worst and the best Have gone to their eternal rest There shrines and palaces and towers Time-eaten towers that tremble not Resemble nothing that is ours Around by lifting winds forgot Resignedly beneath the sky the melancholy waters lie. No rays from the holy heaven come down on the long night time of that town, but light from out the lurid sea shines up the turrets silently, gleams up the pinnacles far and free, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon like walls, up shadowy, long forgotten bowers of sculpted ivy and stone flowers, up many and many a marvellous shrine where wreathed frises intertwine the viol, the violet, and the vine. Resignedly beneath the sky the melancholy waters lie, so blend the turrets and shadows there that all seem pendulous in air, while from a proud tower in the town death looks gigantically down. There, open fanes and gaping graves yawn level with the luminous waves, but not the riches there that lie within each idol's diamond eye, not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed, for no ripples curl, alas! Along that wilderness of glass, no swelling tell that winds may be, Upon some far-off happier sea, No heavings hint that winds have been On seas less hideously serene. For lo, a stir is in the air, The wave, there is a movement there, As if the towers cast aside, In slightly sinking the dull tide, As if their tops had feebly given A void within the filmy heaven. The waves have now a redder glow, the hours are breathing faint and low, and when, amid no earthly moans, down, down that town shall settle hence, hell rising from a thousand thrones shall do it reverence. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Golden Verses of Pythagoras Translated by Nicholas Rowe. Read for LibriVox.org by Abe Neiman. First to the gods thy humble homage pay, The greatest this, and first of laws obey. Perform thy vows, observe thy plighted troth, And let religion bind thee to thy oath. The heroes next demand thy just regard, renowned on earth and to the stars preferred to light and endless life their virtues sure reward do rites perform and honors to the dead to every wise to every pious shade with lowly duty to thy parents bow and grace and favor to thy kindred show for what concerns the rest of humankind Choose but the man to virtue best inclined. Him to thy arms receive, him to thy bosom bind. Possessed of such a friend, preserve him still, nor thwart his counsels with thy stubborn will. Pliant to all his admonitions prove, and yield to all his offices of love. Him from thy heart so true, so justly dear, 
let no rash word nor light offences tear bear all thou canst still with his failing strive and to the utmost still and still forgive for strong necessity alone explores the secret vigour of our latent powers rouses and urges on the lazy heart forced to itself unknown before to exert by use thy stronger appetites assuage thy gluttony thy sloth thy lust thy rage from each dishonest act of shame forbear of others and thyself alike beware let reverence of thyself thy thoughts control and guard the sacred temple of thy soul let justice o'er thy word and deed preside and reason even thy meanest actions guide for know that death is man's appointed doom know that the day of great account will come when thy past life shall strictly be surveyed each word each deed be in the balance laid and all the good and all the ill most justly be repaid for wealth the perishing uncertain good ebbing and flowing like the fickle flood that knows no sure no fixed abiding place but wandering loves from hand to hand to pass revolve the getter's joy and the loser's pain and think if it be worth thy while to gain of all those sorrows that attend mankind with patience bear the lot to thee assigned nor think it chance nor murmur at the load for know what man calls fortune is from god in what thou mayest from wisdom seek relief and let her healing hand assuage thy grief yet still whate'er the righteous doom ordains what cause soever multiplies thy pains let not those pains as ills be understood for god delights not to afflict the good the reasoning art to various ends applied is oft a sure but oft an erring guide thy judgment therefore sound and cool preserve nor lightly from thy resolution swerve the dazzling pomp of words does oft deceive and sweet persuasion wins the easy to believe when fools and liars labor to persuade be dumb and let the babblers vainly plead this above all this precept chiefly learn this nearly does and first thy self-concern let not example let no soothing tongue prevail upon thee with a siren song to do thy soul's immortal essence wrong of good and ill by words and deeds expressed choose for thyself and always choose the best let weary thought each enterprise forerun and ponder on thy task before begun lest folly should the wretched work deface and mock thy fruitless labours with disgrace fools huddle on and always are in haste act without thought and thoughtless words they waste but thou in all thou dost with early cares strive to prevent at first a fate like theirs that sorrow on the end may never wait nor sharp repentance make thee wise too late beware thy meddling hand in aught to try that does beyond thy reach of knowledge lie but seek to know and bend thy serious thought to search the profitable knowledge out so joys on joys for ever shall increase wisdom shall crown thy labours and shall bless thy life with pleasure and thy end with peace nor let the body want its part but share a just proportion of thy tender care for health and welfare prudently provide and let its lawful wants be all supplied let sober draughts refresh and wholesome fare decaying nature's wasted force repair and sprightly exercise the duller spirit's cheer in all things still which to this care belong observe this rule to guard thy soul from wrong by virtuous use 
thy life and manners frame manly and simply pure and free from blame provoke not envy's deadly rage but fly the glancing curse of her malicious eye seek not in needless luxury to waste thy wealth and substance with a spendthrift's haste yet flying these be watchful lest thy mind prone to extremes and equal danger find and be to sordid avarice inclined distant alike from each to neither lean but ever keep the happy golden mean be careful still to guard thy soul from wrong and let thy thought prevent thy hand and tongue let not the stealing god of sleep surprise nor creep in slumbers on thy weary eyes ere every action of the former day strictly thou dost and righteously survey with reverence at thy own tribunal stand and answer justly to thy own demand where have i been and what have i transgressed what good or ill has this day's life expressed where have i failed in what i ought to do in what to god to man or to myself i owe inquire severe whate'er from first to last from morning's dawn till evening's gloom has passed if evil were thy deeds repenting mourn and let thy soul with strong remorse be torn if good the good with peace of mind repay and to thy secret self with pleasure say rejoice my heart for all went well to-day these thoughts and chiefly these thy mind should move employ thy study and engage thy love these are the rules which will to virtue lead and teach thy feet her heavenly paths to tread this by his name i swear whose sacred love first to mankind explained the mystic four source of eternal nature and almighty powers in all thou dost first let thy prayers ascend and to the gods thy labor first commend from them implore success and hope a prosperous end so shall thy abler mind be taught to soar and wisdom in her secret ways explore to range through heaven above and earth below immortal gods and mortal men to know so shalt thou learn what power does all control what bounds the parts and what unites the whole and rightly judge in all this wondrous frame how universal nature is the same so shalt thou ne'er thy vain affections place on hopes of what shall never come to pass man wretched man thou shalt be taught to know who bears within himself the inborn cause of woe unhappy race that never yet could tell how near their good and happiness they dwell deprived of sense they neither hear nor see fettered in vice they seek not to be free but stupid to their own sad fate agree like ponderous rolling stones oppressed with ill the weight that loads them makes them roll on still bereft of choice and freedom of the will for native strife in every bosom reigns and secretly an impious war maintains provoke not this but let the combat cease and every yielding passion sue for peace wouldst thou great jove thou father of mankind reveal the demon for that talk assigned the wretched race an end of woes would find and yet be bold o man divine thou art and of the god's celestial essence part nor sacred nature is from thee concealed but to thy race her mystic rules revealed these if to know thou happily attain soon shalt thou perfect be in all that i ordain thy wounded soul to health thou shalt restore and free from every pain she felt before abstain i warn from meats unclean and foul so keep thy body pure so free thy soul so rightly judge 
thy reason so maintain reason which heaven did for thy guide ordain let that best reason ever hold the rein then if this mortal body thou forsake and thy glad flight to the pure ether take among the gods exalted shalt thou shine immortal incorruptible divine the tyrant death securely shalt thou brave and scorn the dark dominion of the grave end of poem this recording is in the public domain read by abe neiman High Flight by John Gillespie McGee, Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth And danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth Of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things You have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung, High in the sunlit silence, hovering there, I've chased the shouting winds along, And flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long delirious burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, Where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, Put out my hand and touched the face of God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Titus E. Garnett If life were but a dream, my love, And death the waking time, If day had not a beam, my love, And night had not a rhyme, a barren, barren world were this, without one saving gleam. I'd only ask that with a kiss you'd wake me from this dream. If dreaming were the sum of days, and loving were the bane, if battling for the wreath of bays could soothe the heart and pain, I scorn the meed of battle's might, all others aim above. I choose the human's higher right to suffer and to love. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Looking at a Portrait by Joseph Seaman Cotter, Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Titus E. Garnett. Oh, why are there eyes like these that sparkle and dapple and tease, so wide with the morning, so deep with the night, dancing and gleaming in passion delight? Oh, why are there eyes like these? Oh, why are there lips like these, caressed by the southern breeze, that beckon and call and hold a slave all who therewith each soul cry leave? Oh, why are there lips like these? Oh, why are there arms like these, that crumple and crush as they please? A weak man's heart in their embrace brings a glow of red to a strong man's face. Oh, why are there arms like these? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. May Morning by Stephen Vincent Bennett Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Mayworm I lie stretched out upon the window seat, And doze, and read a page or two, and doze, And feel the air like water on me close, Great waves of sunny air that lip and beat, With a small noise monotonous and sweet against the window, And the scent of cool, frail flowers by some brown and dew-drenched pool Possesses me from drowsy head to feet. This is the time of all sufficing laughter At idiotic things someone has done, And there is neither past nor vague hereafter, And all your body stretches in the sun, And drinks the light in like a liquid thing. 
filled with the divine languor of late spring end of poem this recording is in the public domain mementos by kerr or bell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt perard mementos by kerr or bell arranging long locked drawers and shelves of cabinets shut up for years what a strange task we've set ourselves how still the lonely room appears how strange this mass of ancient treasures mementos of past pains and pleasures these volumes clasped with costly stone with print all faded gilding gone these fans of leaves from indian trees these crimson shells from indian seas these tiny portraits set in rings once doubtless deemed such precious things keepsakes bestowed by love on faith and worn till the receiver's death now stored with cameos china shells in this old closet's dusty cells i scarcely think for ten long years a hand has touched these relics old and coating each slow formed appears the growth of green and antique mould all in this house is mossing over all is unused and dim and damp nor light nor warmth the rooms discover bereft for years of fire and lamp the sun sometimes in summer enters the casements with a reviving ray but the long rains of many winters moulder the very walls away and outside all is ivy clinging to chimney lattice gable gray scarcely one little red rose springing through the green moss can force its way unscared the daw and starling nestle where the tall turret rises high and winds alone come near to rustle the thick leaves where the cradles lie i sometimes think when late at even i climb the stair reluctantly some shape that should be well in heaven or ill elsewhere will pass by me I fear to see the very faces familiar thirty years ago, even in the old accustomed places which look so cold and gloomy now. I've come to close the window hither at twilight when the sun was down, and fear my very soul would wither lest something should be dimly shown. Too much the buried form resembling of her who once was mistress here, lest doubtful shade or moonbeam trembling might take her aspect once so dear hers was this chamber in her time it seemed to me a pleasant room for then no cloud of grief or crime had cursed it with a settled gloom i had not seen death's image laid in shroud and sheet on yonder bed before she married she was blessed blessed in her youth blessed in her worth her mind was calm, its sunny rest shone in her eyes more clear than mirth. And when, attired in rich array, light, lustrous hair about her brow, she yonder sat, a kind of day, lit up what seemed so gloomy now. These grim oak walls even then were grim. That old carved chair was then antique, but what around looked dusk and dim served as a foil to her fresh cheek her neck and arms of hue so fair eyes of unclouded smiling light her soft and curled and floating hair gems and attire as rainbow bright reclined in yonder deep recess oft times she would at evening lie watching the sun she seemed to bless with happy glance the glorious sky. She loved such scenes, and as she gazed, her face evinced her spirit's mood. Beauty or grandeur ever raised in her a deep-felt gratitude. But of all lovely things she loved, a cloudless moon on summer night. Full oft have I impatience proved to see how long her still delight would find a theme in reverie out on the lawn or where the trees 
let in the luster fitfully as their boughs parted momently to the soft languid summer breeze alas that she should e'er have flung those pure though lonely joys away deceived by false and guileful tongue she gave her hand then suffered wrong oppressed ill-used she faded young and died of grief by slow decay open that casket look how bright those jewels flash upon the sight the brilliance have not lost a ray of luster since her wedding day but see upon that pearly chain how dim lies time's discoloring stain i've seen that by her daughter worn for ere she died a child was born a child that ne'er its mother knew that lone and almost friendless grew for ever when its step drew nigh averted was the father's eye and then a life impure and wild made him a stranger to his child absorbed in vice he little cared on what she did or how she fared the love withheld she never sought she grew uncherished learnt untaught to her the inward life of thought full soon was open laid i know not if her friendlessness did sometimes on her spirit press but plaint she never made the bookshelves were her darling treasures she rarely seemed the time to measure while she could read alone and she too loved the twilight wood and often in her mother's mood away to yonder hill would hie like her to watch the setting sun or see the stars born one by one out of the darkening sky nor would she leave that hill till night trembled from pole to pole with light even then upon her homeward way long long her wandering steps delayed to quit the sombre forest shade through which her eerie pathway lay you ask if she had beauty's grace i know not but a nobler face my eyes have seldom seen a keen and fine intelligence and better still the truest sense were in her speaking mien but bloom or lustre was there none only at moments fitful shone an ardour in her eye that kindled on her cheek a flush warm as a red sky's passing blush and quick with energy her speech too was not common speech no wish to shine or aim to teach was in her words displayed she still began with quiet sense but oft the force of eloquence came to her lips in aid language and voice unconscious changed and thoughts in other words arranged her fervid soul transfused into the hearts of those who heard and transient strength and ardor stirred in minds to strength unused yet in gay crowd or festal glare grave and retiring was her air twas seldom save with me alone that fire of feeling freely shone she loved not awes nor wonders gaze nor even exaggerated praise nor even notice if too keen the curious gazer searched her mien nature's own green expanse revealed the world the pleasures she could prize on free hillside in sunny field in quiet spots by woods concealed grew wild and fresh her chosen joys yet nature's feelings deeply lay in that endowed and youthful frame shrined in her heart and hid from day they burned unseen with silent flame in youth's first search for mental light she lived but to reflect and learn but soon her mind's maturer might for stronger task did pant and yearn and stronger task did fate assign task that a giant's strength might strain to suffer long and ne'er repine be calm in frenzy smile at pain pale with the secret war of feeling sustained with courage mute yet high the wounds at which she bled revealing only by altered cheek and eye she bore in silence but when passion surged in her soul with ceaseless foam 
the storm at last brought desolation and drove her exile from her home and silent still she straight assembled the wrecks of strength her soul retained for though the wasted body trembled the unconquered mind to quail disdained she crossed the sea now lone she wanders by seines or rhines or arno's flow fain would i know if distance renders relief or comfort to her woe fain would i know if henceforth ever these eyes shall read and hers again that light of love which faded never though dim so long with secret pain she will return but cold and altered like all whose hopes too soon depart like all on whom have beat unsheltered the bitter blasts that blight the heart no more shall i behold her lying calm on a pillow smoothed by me no more that spirit worn with sighing will know the rest of infancy if still the paths of lore she follow twill be the tired and goaded will she'll only toil the aching hollow the joyless blank of life to fill and oh full oft quite spent and weary her hand will pause her head decline that labor seems so hard and dreary on which no ray of hope may shine thus the pale blight of time and sorrow will shade with gray her soft dark hair then comes the day that knows no morrow and death succeeds to long despair so speaks experience sage and hoary i see it plainly know it well like one who having read a story each incident their end can tell touch not that ring twas his the sire of that forsaken child and not his relics can inspire save memories sin defiled i who sat by his wife's deathbed i who his daughter loved could almost curse the guilty dead for woes the guiltless proved and heaven did curse they found him laid when crime for wrath was rife cold with a suicidal blade clutched in his desperate grip twas near that long deserted hut which in the wood decays death's axe self-wielded struck his root and locked his desperate days you know the spot where three black trees lift up their branches fell and moaning ceaseless as the seas still seem in every passing breeze the deed of blood to tell they named him mad and laid his bones where holier ashes lie yet doubt not that his spirit groans in hell's eternity but lo night closing o'er the earth infects our thoughts with gloom come let us strive to rally mirth where glows a clear and tranquil hearth in some more cheerful room end of mementos by her bell my november guest by robert frost read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp my sorrow, when she's here with me, thinks these dark days of autumn rain are beautiful as days can be. She loves the bear, the withered tree. She walks the sodden pasture lane. Her pleasure will not let me stay. She talks, and I am fain to list. She's glad the birds are gone away. She's glad her simple worsted gray is silver now with clinging mist. The desolate deserted trees the faded earth, the heavy sky, the beauties she so truly sees, she thinks I have no eye for these, and vexes me for reason why. Not yesterday I learned to know the love of bare November days before the coming of the snow, but it were vain to tell her so, and they are better for her praise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Old Palette by Christopher Pierce Cranch Read for LibriVox.org 
by Titus E. Garnett. Many a year has fled away since this old palette was new, as may be seen by the spots of green and yellow and red and blue. Many a picture was painted from this, while many were only dreamed. The shadow and light like the black and white across my life has streamed. Except, my friend, this plain old board, all plastered and in brown, where the pleasure and strife of a painter's life hath left a mosaic ground. The color that went to the picture's soul hath left but its body behind, yet strive to trace on its cloudy face some gleam of the artist's mind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nature by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio As a fond mother, when the day is o'er, Leads by the hand her little child to bed, Half willing, half reluctant to be led, And leave his broken playthings on the floor, Still gazing at them through the open door, nor wholly reassured and comforted by promises of others in their stead, which, though more splendid, may not please him more. So nature deals with us, and takes away our playthings one by one, and by the hand leads us to rest so gently that we go scarce knowing if we wish to go or stay, being too full of sleep to understand how far the unknown transcends the what we know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Platonic Love by William Cartwright. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson. Tell me no more of minds embracing minds, And hearts exchanged for hearts, That spirits, spirits meet, As winds do winds, And mix their subtlest parts, That two unbodied essences may kiss, And then like angels twist and feel one bliss. I was that silly thing that once was wrought to practice this thin love. I climbed from sex to soul, from soul to thought, but thinking there to move, headlong I rolled from thought to soul, and then from soul I lighted at the sex again. <clears throat> as some strict down-looked men pretend to fast who yet in closets eat so lovers who profess they spirits taste feed yet on grosser meat i know they boast they souls to souls convey howe'er they meet the body is the way come i will undeceive thee they that tread those vain aerial ways are like young heirs and alchemists misled to waste their wealth and days for searching thus to be for ever rich they only find a medicine for the itch end of poem this recording is in the public domain Not They Who Soar by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Not they who soar, but they who plod their rugged way Unhelped to God are heroes. They who higher fare and flying fan the upper air Miss all the toil that hugs the sod. Tis they whose backs have felt the rod, Whose feet have pressed the path unshod, May smile upon defeated care, Not they who soar. 
high up there are no thorns to prod nor boulders lurking neath the clod to turn the keenness of the share for flight is ever free and rare but heroes they the soil who've trod not they who soar end of poem this recording is in the public domain an old man's winter night by robert frost read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp all out of doors looked darkly in at him through the thin frost almost in separate stars that gathers on the pane in empty rooms what kept his eyes from giving back the gaze was the lamp tilted near them in his hand what kept him from remembering what it was that brought him to that creaking room was age he stood with barrels round him at a loss and having scared the cellar under him and clomping there he scared it once again and clomping off and scared the outer night which has its sounds familiar like the roar of trees and crack of branches common things but nothing so like beating on a box a light he was to no one but himself where now he sat concerned with he knew what a quiet light and then not even that he consigned to the moon such as she was so late arising to the broken moon as better than the sun in any case for such a charge his snow upon the roof his icicles along the wall to keep and slept the log that shifted with a jolt once in the stove disturbed him and he shifted and eased his heavy breathing but still slept one aged man one man can't fill a house a farm a countryside or if he can it's thus he does it of a winter night end of poem this recording is in the public domain Rains by Oscar Williams, read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. In the country the rain comes softly with timid feet, a gray silence is in her face, and strands of darkness blowing from her hair. And trees are dark in her eyes, and the wind is a mournful gesture softly the rain comes over the hills and her face is memory it is filled with the twilight blowing of waves and grasses it is filled with shadowy cloud paws feeling among the valleys it is filled with the leap of trees that are instantly caught by the earth the spirit of all things breathes on the invisible pain of time and slowly out of the shadows the gray face of the rain comes into being softly the rain comes over the hills and her face is sorrow but the rain in the city is a jazz rain the legs of the rain in the city are nimble she is loud on the stones on the rooftops on the windows her dancing is filled with the sway and the glitter of tinsel behind her the street is a wide grin showing the black teeth of houses the street is a wicked leer dark with ugly passion but though the laughter of the jazz rain is coarse in the gutter though her legs are nimble and innumerable on the pavements though the jazz rain speaks so loud the brazen rain has never a word for me and a poem this recording is in the public domain Rubiat of Hafez, read for LibriVox.org, by Algy Pug, Perth, Western Australia. When rosebuds into chalices unroll for love of wine, Narcissus bears the bowl. Ah, happy he who learns the crimson lore, and, wine's own Sufi, 
liberates his soul. Of that old wine some vanished sultan grew, Give me, that I may paint life's scenes anew. Oh, make me heedless of the heedless world, That I may sing the world's desire to you. Come, love, and wine beside the river's brink. In every cup some shallow care will sink. Life's span is but the roses, ten dear days, Then chain the ten with laughter's golden link. O oh, lovers, you whose happy hands enlace, For whom time's wheel, forgotten, flies apace, When my time cometh, hail the endless round, That other Aprils may recall my face. Come thou, and bring me wine, the source of joy, Heed not the wiles that meaner foes employ. Smooth is the speech of him who bids thee stay, And sweet are words that sweeter lips decoy. If, like us, you should fall into love's snare, Wine, wine alone, can free you from despair. We are the world-consuming revellers, Sit not with us, lest none should speak you fair. Youth is the tap that draws the wine most sweet. Unhappy lover, drink and drown defeat. Creation rocks to ruin in the end, And ruined lords their ruined halls complete. Take not your lips from the tankard's brimming lip, Lest fame and fortune in a moment slip. In the world cup are sweet and bitter blent, One from love's mouth, one from the tankard sip. A woman's smile, a lute to rouse the morn, A nook, a heart unbound, a flagon drawn, And when the red wine dances through my veins, From Hatim I'll not beg a barley corn. My moon, in whose grave beauty day grows dim, A fairer disc than cows's rounded rim, Hath cast all hearts into her dimples well, And, sealed with amber, bade them sink or swim. As, one by one, the garments from her glide, Behold a moon that hath no peer beside, O flesh so frail that her red heart imbues, Like a red ruby stains the lucent tide. Around her waist my hand unchided stole, This much I gained, yet still desired the whole, My arm had circled round the citadel, and, still unmastered, she defied control. I said, Ah, pretty mole of my delight. She answered, Oh, thou fond and foolish wight, No mole the mirror of my charm retains, Tis thy dark glance upon my beauty bright. Quoth I, Your lip, the fount of life, she cried. Quoth I, Your mouth, tis sugar, coral died quoth i your speech ah sweetly hafez sang for each soft word some golden tongue is tied the eyes that babil's sorceries hath taught must all their bright enchantments come to naught and that small ear nay from the fadeless pearls of hafez's song her pendant shall be wrought o oh, you to whom the sun and moon have bowed, Upon your thresholds dust their foreheads proud, Bid me not burn in expectation's fire, Nor seat me in the shadow of the cloud. Think not to scorn the fierceness of a sigh, From that which kindles flame may flames draw nigh. O, oh, be not heedless of the tears of night, Or the dawn's grey sighs that neath your casement die. My heart makes room for grief, for grief of you. By this dear grief my wounds shall heal anew. The more you heap your vengeance on my heart, The more tormented she shall prove more true. Tonight I'll sleep in blood for all my pain. Without the bed of rest I shall remain. Sweet, and you doubt me, send your wraith or dreams To watch the night upon my torment wane. She told me, I am yours to have and hold. Take heart, let care by patience be controlled. Ah, what is heart? Some greybeard doth reply, 
the clot of blood a thousand cares enfold she gave me first the loving cup to bind the cup of cruelty she then assigned and when with soul and body burned i fell dust at her feet she gave me to the wind i was a beggar of her love bereft salt rankles in the wound that parting left my heavy heart one day foretold the end then fell the sword and our one life was cleft sweet you have moulded me to please the foe i was like spring that now like autumn grow once in your quiver still and straight i lay till passion came and bent me like a bow return my soul your wandering beauty seeks return my heart her desolation speaks o oh, golden sunshine of your face reveal and burn the blinding teardrops from my cheeks in crowds i see no image save thine own my ways are centred in thy street alone and though thou reignest and the world hath sleep no kiss of slumber my tired lids have known alone i weep more tears than candles shed tears like the twinkling flagon's rosy red and like the wine cup since the heart is full when the sad harp bewails my tears are bled ah love for kisses long withheld i die your absent lips have slain me with a sigh a ruthless pen writes finis to my tale return for while i wait again i die who can recall the rosebud of chigil the story of the burning heart reveal my heart is desolate since friends are none to whom my tale of sorrows can appeal your eyes where lies and magic play their part from whose false dusk the swords of battle start how soon they weary of my constant sight stones that were tears now strike me from your heart each friend who of constancy became a foe each lovely face a soiling flame they say the night is great with hidden things since none beheld her who hath shared her shame a time of broken vows that none would mend the bitter foe was once a faithful friend so to the skirts of solitude i cling lest friendship lure me to an evil end for gold the beauties of the world are wed their charms upon the merchant's mat they spread even that sultan of the worlds of spring the proud narcissus droops a golden head how shall this golden tyranny abide this breaking of a people's heart and pride there is a blood-stained sword in broken hearts whom the red steel doth follow woe betide when tyrants rule can gold redeem the earth when sorrow haunts the home can joy have birth not all the promised eons of delight these seven dull days of mortal care are worth o son withdraw your heart from faithless time let faith her husband be your friend sublime be heartless ere like me you vainly seek to hold her mocking beauty with a rhyme oh would that fortune met me by the way the changing time would grant me slow delay and when the rains fell from the hands of youth that age might prove the stirrup for my stay in vain pursuits the random years have flown what gain is mine from summers overthrown the friends of yours are numbered with my foes the lilies fall the roses all are blown each day some greater grief my heart hath borne mine eyes are pierced by separation's thorn and destiny to all my plaint replies another load awaits another morn yet what avails to foam with grief like wine we may not cope with sorrows line on line those young fresh lips divorce not from the cup 
Lips that are young make every draught divine. Seek not to compass vengeance for thy wrong, but draw the sparkling wine with mirth and song. Take wit and wisdom to thy tent alone. Fools to the company of fools belong. Better the world in a mortal bray, dip in the heart's blood as it ebbs away, or drag a hundred years of chains and gloom, than for one moment with a fool delay. Cease, cease to sorrow for a world of sin. Forsake the world and all thou hast therein. Go, follow love where wine cups fire the gloom, where the red vintage swells the tawny skin. A girl whose figure shamed the cypress tall, let her bright beauty on a mirror fall. I laid a kerchief at her feet. She smiled. What happy thought of union holds you thrall? Methinks I hear joy beating with his wings, the perfume of passionate roses round me clings. The wind has caught a story from her mouth. Oh, rare and wondrous is the tale he brings. Return, return, thou many-voiced gale, warm with my burning, her young heart assail. Lest she be angered, sing to her alone, yet in the midst of maidens tell my tale. Whence did the tangles of your hair arise, and the dreams that haunt the shadows of your eyes? Since none have shaken petals on your path, O oh, whence the attar that around you lies? The jasmine blooms in the shadow of your hair, lips beyond a price, since Aden's pearls lie there. Like you, the soul is ever wine-inspired, the wine's bright soul shines through a form as fair. Rose-lit, my tears like her twin roses show, my heart's red blood through aching eyes doth flow. She asked me, seeking for a fair reply, why do thine eyes like lakes in twilight glow? O oh, great of soul, how gladly would I give all that I am to thee by whom I live. If thou wouldst know the bitterness of hell, for friendship's water through an empty sieve. Sweet lips soon break the promise they proclaim. God's lovers never keep them from the flame. If the beloved yield to your desire, yielding, she writes the record of your fame. I clung to the beloved's locks with tears. I said, Be thou physician of my fears? She answered, Take me, let my tresses go, Cling light to pleasure, not to length of years. Twere folly to thyself to be more kind, Or from creation call thyself to mind. Learn wisdom from the pupil of the eye, that looks on all men, yet to self is blind. Ask strength of him who plucked at Kaibar's door, the gift of giving from his slave implore. O Hafez, if for grace of God thou yearn, ask of the fount for wine of Kaus's store. Then, long as stands the heavenly decree, the wind shall tell the youngest rose of thee. The cup that lights the hand of Taktamun, drink, and thou shalt be loves immortally. Around life's keep the rodent waters roar, the measure of our years is brimming o'er. Soon, soon, O oh friend, the janitor of time shall cast life's chattels through the broken door. We hope for all things from the sky's caress, yet tremble as the leaf when days grow less. You said no colour beyond black abides, then why the snows upon the raven tress? Come, sit with love, and while the wine cup flows, enfold the cypress form, the heart of rose. O oh, wounded lover, seeking to be whole, ask Hajjam's lancet of the cure it knows. That night we wrought love's miracle again, for one brief gloom one soul was born of twain. Now death shall weary at the springs of youth by singing waters that he sealed in vain. The Sultan's friend, known by the least to fame, giver of golden words that all acclaim, 
Who goes from Shiraz unto Samarkand, that Haji Hafez thrills not with his name? O thou, great almoner of human need, who solvest all, dispensing blame and meed, why should I bear my secret heart to thee, since all my hidden secrets thou canst read? The rosebud hides herself for shame of thee, nor drows Narcissus dare to look on thee. How can the rose her sovereignty proclaim? Her light is of the moon, the moon's from thee. Blame not my tears for the secret they confessed. Deal gently with a heart that cannot rest. O Sufi, since thou knowest his desire, Scorn not the wanderer for the lifelong quest. One that should dwell in squalor for a space Of former pride will not retain a trace, But some poor stranger in a foreign land Sighs, and remembers still his native place. The way to thee lies over grief and pain, The soul gropes on, the darkness doth remain. We only look upon the perfect face When the lamp failing shows the quest is vain. Till the desire of love be gratified, Till the body's kingdom without king abide, My hope is ever of the court of God, That all the gates of joy be open wide. End of the Rubiat of Hafez This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Mayworm How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace i love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight i love thee freely as men strive for right i love thee purely as they turn from praise I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Stanzas on the Death of His Father by Jorge Manrique Translated by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta O oh, let the soul her slumbers break, Let thought be quickened and awake, Awake to see how soon this life is past and gone, And death comes softly stealing on, How silently! Swiftly our pleasures glide away, Our hearts recall the distant day with many signs, the moments that are speeding fast we heed not, But the past, the past more highly prides. Onward its course the present keeps, Onward the constant current sweeps, Till life is done. And did we judge of time aright, The past and future in their flight Would be as one. Let no one fondly dream again that hope and all her shadowy train will not decay. Fleeting as were the dreams of old, remembered like a tale that's told, they pass away. Our lives are rivers gliding free to that unfathomed boundless sea, the silent grave. 
Thither all earthly pomp and boast roll, To be swallowed up and lost in one dark wave. Thither the mighty torrents stray, Thither the brook pursues its way, And tinkling rill, they all are equal. Side by side, the poor man and the son of pride Lie calm and still. I will not here invoke the throng of orators and the sons of song, the deathless few. Fiction entices and deceives, and sprinkled o'er her fragrant leaves lies poisonous dew. To one alone my thoughts arise, the eternal truth, the good and wise. To him I cry, who shared on earth our common lot, but the world comprehended not his deity. This world is but the rugged road, which leads us to the bright abode of peace above. So let us choose that narrow way, which leads no traveler's foot astray from realms of love. Our cradle is the starting place, Life is the running of the race. We reach the goal when, in the mansions of the blest, Death leaves to its eternal rest the weary soul. Did we but use it as we ought, This world would school each wandering thought to its high state. Faith wings the soul beyond the sky, Up to that better world on high, for which we wait. Yes, the glad messenger of love to guide us to our home above the Savior came. Born amid mortal cares and fears, he suffered in this veil of tears a death of shame. Behold, of what delusive worth the bubbles we pursue on earth, the shapes we chase, Amid a world of treachery, They vanish ere death shuts the eye, And leave no trace. Time steals them from us, Chances strange, Disastrous accident, And change that come to all. Even in the most exalted state, Relentless sweeps the stroke of fate, The strongest fall. Tell me, the charms that lovers seek in the clear eye and blushing cheek, the hues that play o'er rosy lip and brow of snow, when hoary age approaches slow, ah, where are they? The cunning skill, the curious arts, the glorious strength that youth imparts in life's first stage. These shall become a heavy weight when time swings wide his outward gate to weary age. The noble blood of Gothic name, heroes emblazoned high to fame in long array. How, in the onward course of time, the landmarks of that race sublime were swept away? Some the degraded slaves of lust, Prostrate and trampled in the dust, Shall rise no more. Others, by guilt and crime, Maintain the scutcheon That without a stain their fathers bore. Wealth and the high estate of pride, With what untimely speed they glide, How soon depart, Bid not the shadowy phantoms stay, The vassals of a mistress they, A fickle heart. These gifts in fortune's hands are found, Her swift revolving wheel turns round, And they are gone. No rest the inconstant goddess knows, But changing, and without repose, Still hurries on. Even could the hand of avarice save its gilded baubles, till the grave reclaimed its prey, 
let none on such poor hopes rely. Life, like an empty dream, flits by, and where are they? Earthly desires and sensual lust are passions springing from the dust. They fade and die, but in the life beyond the tomb they seal the immortal spirit's doom eternally. The pleasures and delights which mask in treacherous smiles life's serious task, what are they all but the fleet coursers of the chase, and death an ambush in the race wherein we fall? No foe, no dangerous pass we heed, brook no delay, but onward speed with loosened rein, and when the fatal snare is near, we strive to check our mad career, but strive in vain. Could we new charms to age impart, and fashion with a cunning art the human face, as we could clothe the soul with light, and make the glorious spirit bright with heavenly grace? How busily each passing hour should we exert that magic power? What ardor show to deck the sensual slave of sin, yet leave the free-born soul within, in weeds of woe? Monarchs, the powerful and the strong, famous in history and in song of olden time, saw by the stern decrees of fate, their kingdoms lost, and desolate their race sublime. Who is the champion? Who the strong? Pontiff and priest and sceptred throng. On these shall fall, as heavily, the hand of death, as when it stays the shepherd's breath beside his stall. I speak not of the Trojan name, neither its glory nor its shame has met our eyes, nor of Rome's great and glorious dead, though we have heard so oft and read their histories. Little avails it now to know of ages past so long ago, nor how they rolled. Our theme shall be of yesterday, which to oblivion sweeps away, like days of old. Where is the king? Don Juan. Where each royal prince and noble heir of Aragon? Where are the courtly gallantries, the deeds of love, and high emprise in battle done, tourney and joust that charmed the eye? and scarf, and gorgeous panoply, and nodding plume. What were they but a pageant scene? What but the garlands gay and green that deck the tomb? Where are the high-born dames, and where their gay attire, and jeweled hair, and odors sweet? Where are the gentle knights that came to kneel and breathe love's ardent flame low at their feet. Where is the song of Troubadour? Where are the lute and gay tambour they loved of yore? Where is the mazy dance of old, the flowing robes inwrought with gold the dancers wore? And he who next the scepter swayed, Henry, whose royal court displayed such power and pride. Oh, in what winning smiles arrayed, the world its various pleasures laid his throne beside. But oh, how false and full of guile that world, which wore so soft a smile, but to betray! She, that had been his friend before, now from the fated monarch tore her charms away. The countless gifts, the stately walls, the royal palaces and halls, all filled with gold, plate with armorial bearings wrought, 
chambers with ample treasures fraught of wealth untold. The noble steeds, and harness bright, and gallant lord, and stalwart knight in rich array. Where shall we seek them now? Alas! Like the bright dewdrops on the grass, they passed away. His brother, too, whose factious zeal usurped the scepter of Castile, unskilled to reign, what a gay, brilliant court had he, when all the flower of chivalry was in his train. But he was mortal, and the breath that flamed from the hot forge of death blasted his years. Judgment of God, that flame by thee, when raging fierce and fearfully, was quenched in tears. Spain's haughty constable, the true and gallant master, whom we knew, most loved of all, breathe not a whisper of his pride. He on the gloomy scaffold died, ignoble fall. The countless treasures of his care, his villages and villas fair, his mighty power, what were they all but grief and shame, tears and a broken heart when came the parting hour? His other brothers, proud and high, masters, who in prosperity might rival kings, who made the bravest and the best the bondsmen of their high behest, their underlings. What was their prosperous estate, when high exalted and elate with power and pride? What but a transient gleam of light, a flame which, glaring at its height, grew dim and died? So many a duke of royal name, marquis and count of spotless fame, and baron brave that might the sword of empire wield. All these, O oh death, hast thou concealed in the dark grave. Their deeds of mercy and of arms, in peaceful days or war's alarms, when thou dost show, O oh death, thy stern and angry face, one stroke of thy all-powerful mace can overthrow. Unnumbered hosts that threaten nigh, pennon and standard flaunting high, and flag displayed, high battlements entrenched around, bastion and moated wall, and mound, and palisade, and covered trench, secure and deep, all these cannot one victim keep, O death, from thee, when thou dost battle in thy wrath, and thy strong shafts pursue their path unerringly. O world, so few the years we live, would that the life which thou dost give were life indeed! Alas! Thy sorrows fall so fast. Our happiest hour is when, at last, the soul is freed. Our days are covered o'er with grief, And sorrows neither few nor brief Veil all in gloom. Left desolate of real good, Within this cheerless solitude No pleasures bloom. Thy pilgrimage begins in tears, and ends in bitter doubts and fears, or dark despair. Midway so many toils appear, that he who lingers longest here knows most of care. Thy goods are bought with many a groan, by the hot sweat of toil alone, and weary hearts. Fleet-footed is the approach of woe, but with a lingering step, and slow its form departs. 
and he the good man's shield and shade to whom all hearts their homage paid as virtue's son roderick manrique he whose name is written on the scroll of fame spain's champion his signal deed and prowess high demand no pompous eulogy ye saw his deeds why should their praise in verse be sung the name that dwells on every tongue no minstrel needs to friends a friend how kind to all the vassals of this ancient hall and feudal fife to foes how stern a foe was he and to the valiant and the free how brave a chief what prudence with the old and wise what grace in youthful gaieties in all how sage benignant to the serf and slave he showed the base and falsely brave a lion's rage his was octavian's prosperous star the rush of caesar's conquering car at battle's call his scipio's virtue his the skill and the indomitable will of hannibal his was a trajan's goodness his a titus's noble charities and righteous laws the arm of hector and the might of tolly to maintain the right in truth's just cause the clemency of antonine aurelius's countenance divine firm gentle still the eloquence of adrian and theodosius's love to man and generous will in tented field and bloody fray an alexander's vigorous sway and stern command the faith of constantine ay more the fervent love camillus bore his native land he left no well-filled treasury he heaped no pile of riches high nor massive plate he fought the moors and in their fall city and tower and castled wall were his estate upon the hard-fought battle-ground brave steeds and gallant riders found a common grave and there the warrior's hand did gain the rents and the long vassal train that conquest gave and if of old his halls displayed the honored and exalted grade his worth had gained so in the dark disastrous hour brothers and bondsmen of his power his hand sustained after high deeds not left untold in the stern warfare which of old twas his to share such noble leagues he made that more and fairer regions than before his guerdon were these are the records half effaced which with the hand of youth he traced on history's page but with fresh victories he drew each fading character anew in his old age by his unrivalled skill by great and veteran service to the state by worth adored he stood in his high dignity the proudest knight of chivalry knight of the sword he found his cities and domains beneath a tyrant's galling chains and cruel power but by fierce battle and blockade soon his own banner was displayed from every tower by the tried valor of his hand his monarch and his native land were nobly served let portugal repeat the story and proud castile 
who shared the glory his arms deserved. And when, so oft, for weal or woe, his life upon the fatal throw had been cast down, when he had served with patriot zeal beneath the banner of Castile his sovereign crown, and done such deeds of valor strong that neither history nor song can count them all. Then, on Ocania's castled rock, death at his portal came to knock, with sudden call, saying, Good cavalier, prepare to leave this world of toil and care with joyful mien. Let thy strong heart of steel this day put on its armor for the fray, the closing scene. Since thou hast been in battle strife, so prodigal of health and life for earthly fame, let virtue nerve thy heart again. Loud on the last stern battle plain, they call thy name. Think not the struggle that draws near too terrible for man, nor fear to meet the foe, nor let thy noble spirit grieve its life of glorious fame to leave on earth below. A life of honor and of worth has no eternity on earth, tis but a name, and yet its glory far exceeds that base and sensual life which leads to want and shame. The eternal life beyond the sky wealth cannot purchase, nor the high and proud estate. The soul in dalliance laid, the spirit corrupt with sin, shall not inherit a joy so great. But the good monk in cloistered cell shall gain it by his book and bell his prayers and tears. And the brave knight, whose arm endures fierce battle, and against the moors his standard rears. And thou, brave knight, whose hand has poured the life-blood of the pagan horde o'er all the land, in heaven shalt thou receive at length the guerdon of thine earthly strength and dauntless hand. Cheered onward by this promise sure, strong in the faith entire and pure thou dost profess, depart. Thy hope is certainty. The third, the better life on high shalt thou possess. O death, no more, no more delay. My spirit longs to flee away and be at rest. The will of heaven my will shall be. I bow to the divine decree, to God's behest. My soul is ready to depart. No thought rebels. The obedient heart breathes forth no sigh. The wish on earth to linger still were vain when tis God's sovereign will that we shall die. O thou, that for our sins didst take a human form, and humbly make thy home on earth, thou, that to thy divinity a human nature didst ally by mortal birth, and in that form didst suffer here torment and agony and fear, so patiently, by thy redeeming grace alone, and not for merits of my own, O oh, pardon me. As thus the dying warrior prayed, without one gathering mist or shade upon his mind, encircled by his family, watched by affection's gentle eye, so soft and kind, his soul to him who gave it rose. God led it to its long repose, 
and glorious rest, and though the warrior's sun has set, its light shall linger round us yet, bright, radiant, blessed. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stanzas by Edgar Allan Poe, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia. How often we forget all time when lone, admiring nature's universal throne, her woods, her wilds, her mountains, the intense reply of hers to our intelligence. One, in youth have I known one with whom the earth in secret communing held as he with it, in daylight and in beauty from his birth, whose fervid flickering torch of life was lit from the sun and stars, whence he had drawn forth a passionate light, such for his spirit was fit. And yet that spirit knew not in the hour of its own fervour what had o'er it power. 2. Perhaps it may be that my mind is wrought to a fever by the moonbeam that hangs o'er. But I will half believe that wild life fraught with more of sovereignty than ancient lore hath ever told. Or is it of a thought the unembodied essence, and no more, that with a quickening spell doth o'er us pass, as dew of the night-time o'er the summer grass? 3. Doth o'er us pass, when, as the expanding eye to the loved object, so the tear to the lid will start, which lately slept in apathy? And yet it need not be, that object, hid from us in life, but common, which doth lie each hour before us, but then only, bid with a strange sound, as of a harp-string broken, to awake us. Tis a symbol and a token. 4. Of what in other worlds shall be, and given in beauty by our God, to those alone who otherwise would fall from life and heaven, drawn by their heart's passion, and that tone, that high tone of the spirit, which hath striven, though not with faith, with godliness, whose throne, with desperate energy, hath beaten down, wearing its own deep feeling as a crown. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tamulane by Edgar Allan Poe, read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug, Perth, Western Australia. Kind solace in a dying hour, such father is not now my theme. I will not madly deem that power of earth may shrive me of the sin unearthly pride hath revelled in. I have no time to dote or dream. You call it hope, that fire of fire. It is but agony of desire, if I can hope. O oh God, I can. Its fount is holier, more divine. I would not call thee fool, old man, but such is not a gift of thine. Know thou the secret of a spirit bowed from its wild pride into shame. O yearning heart, I did inherit thy withering portion with the fame, the searing glory which hath shone amid the jewels of my throne. Halo of hell, and with a pain not hell shall make me fear again. O craving heart, for the lost flowers and sunshine of my summer hours, the undying voice of that dead time, with its interminable chime, rings in the spirit of a spell, upon thy emptiness a knell. I have not always been as now, the fevered diadem on my brow, I claimed and won usurpingly. Hath not the same fierce heirdom given Rome to the Caesar, this to me? the heritage of a kingly mind and a proud spirit which hath striven triumphantly with humankind on mountain soil i first drew life 
the mist of the Tuglay have shed nightly their dews upon my head, and, I believe, the winged strife and tumult of the headlong air have nestled in my very hair. So late from heaven, that dew, it fell, mid dreams of an unholy night, upon me with a touch of hell, while the red flashing of the light from clouds that hung like banners o'er, appeared to my half-closing eye the pageantry of monarchy, and the deep trumpet thunder's roar came hurriedly upon me, telling of human battle, where my voice, my own voice, silly child, was swelling, oh, how my spirit would rejoice and leap within me at the cry, the battle-cry of victory! The rain came down upon my head unsheltered, and the heavy wind rendered me mad and deaf and blind. It was but man, I thought, who shed laurels upon me, and the rush, the torrent of the chilly air, gurgled within my ear the crush of empires, with the captive's prayer, the hum of suitors, and the tone of flattery round a sovereign's throne. My passions, from that hapless hour, usurped the tyranny which men have deemed, since I have reached to power, my innate nature. Be it so. But, father, there lived one who, then, then in my boyhood, when their fire burned with a still intenser glow, for passion must with youth expire, e'en then who knew this iron heart, in woman's weakness had a part. I have no words, alas, to tell the loveliness of loving well, nor would I now attempt to trace the more than beauty of a face whose lineaments upon my mind are shadows on the unstable wind. Thus I remember having dwelt some page of early lore upon, with loitering eye, till I have felt the letters, with their meaning, melt to fantasies with none. Oh, she was worthy of all love, love, as in infancy was mine, Twas such an angel minds above might envy, her young heart the shrine on which my every hope and thought were incense, then a goodly gift, for they were childish and upright, pure, as her young example taught. Why did I leave it, and adrift trust to the fire within for light? We grew in age and love together, roaming the forest and the wild, my breast her shield in wintry weather, and when the friendly sunshine smiled, and she would mark the opening skies, I saw no heaven but in her eyes. Young love's first lesson is the heart, for mid that sunshine and those smiles, when from our little cares apart, and laughing at her girlish wiles, I'd throw me on her throbbing breast, and pour my spirit out in tears, there was no need to speak the rest, no need to quiet any fears of her, who asked no reason why, but turned on me her quiet eye. Yet more than worthy of the love my spirit struggled with and strove, when on the mountain peak, alone, ambition lent it a new tone. I had no being but in thee, the world, and all it did contain in the earth, the air, the sea, its joy, its little lot of pain, that was new pleasure, the ideal, dim vanities of dreams by night, and dimmer nothings which were real, shadows, and a more shadowy light, parted upon their misty wings, and so, confusedly, became thine image, and a name, a name, two separate, yet most intimate things. I was ambitious. Have you known the passion, father? You have not. A cottager, I marked a throne of half the world as all my own, and murmured at such lowly lot. But, like any other dream, upon the vapour of the dew, my own had passed, did not the beam of beauty, which did, while it threw the minute, the hour, the day, oppress my mind with double loveliness? We walked together on the crown of a high mountain, which looked down afar from its proud natural towers of rock and forest, on the hills, the dwindled hills, begirt with bowers, 
and shouting with a thousand rills. I spoke to her of power and pride, but mystically, in such guise that she might deem it naught beside the moment's converse. In her eyes I read, perhaps too carelessly, a mingled feeling with my own, the flush on her bright cheek to me seemed to become a queenly throne, too well that I should let it be, light in the wilderness alone. I wrapped myself in grandeur then, and donned a visionary crown, yet it was not that fantasy had thrown her mantle over me, but that, among the rabble, men, lion ambition is chained down, and crouches to a keeper's hand, not so in deserts where the grand, the wild, the terrible conspire with their own breath to fan his fire. Look round thee now on Samarkand. Is she not queen of earth, her pride above all cities, in her hand their destinies? In all beside of glory which the world hath known, stands she not nobly and alone? Falling, her veriest stepping stone shall form the pedestal of a throne, and who her sovereign? Timor, he whom the astonished people saw striding o'er empires haughtily, a diademed outlaw. O oh, human love, thou spirit given on earth, of all we hope in heaven, which falsed into the soul like rain upon the Siroc, withered plain, and failing in thy power to bless, but leaves the heart a wilderness. I dear, which bindest life around with music of so strange a sound, and beauty of so wild a birth. Farewell, for I have won the earth. When hope, the eagle that towered, could see no cliff beyond him in the sky, his pinions were bent droopingly, and homeward turned his softened eye. T'was sunset. When the sun will part, there comes a sullenness of heart to him who still would look upon the glory of the summer sun. That soul will hate the evening mist, so often lovely, and will list to the sound of the coming darkness, known to those whose spirits hearken, as one who in a dream of night would fly, but cannot from a danger nigh. When though the moon, the white moon, shed all the splendour of her noon, her smile is chilly, and her beam in that time of dreariness will seem, so like you gather in your breath, a portrait taken after death. And boyhood is a summer sun whose waning is the dreariest one, for all we live to know is known, and all we seek to keep hath flown. Let life, then, as the day-flower, fall within the noonday beauty, which is all. I reached my home, my home no more, for all had flown who made it so. I passed from out its mossy door, and though my tread was soft and low, a voice came from the threshold stone of one whom I had earlier known. Oh, I defy thee, hell, to show on beds of fire that burn below a humbler heart, a deeper woe. Father, I firmly do believe, I know. For death, who comes for me from regions of the blessed afar, where there is nothing to deceive, hath left his iron gate ajar, and rays of truth you cannot see are flashing through eternity. I do believe that Eblis hath a snare in every human path, else how, when in the holy grove I wandered of the idol, love, who daily scents his snowy wings, with incense of burnt offerings, from the most unpolluted things, whose pleasant bowers are yet so riven above with trellised rays from heaven, no moat may shun, no tiniest fly, the lightning of his eagle eye. How was it that ambition crept, unseen, amid the revels there, till, growing bold, he laughed? and leapt in the tangles of love's very hair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Child Dancing in the Wind by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Kathleen Napoltz Dance there, upon the shore. What need have you to care 
for wind or water's roar, and tumble out your hair that the salt drops have wet. Being young, you have not known the fool's triumph, nor yet love lost as soon as won, nor the best laborer dead, and all the sheaves to bind. What need have you to dread the monstrous crying of wind? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Adore by Hazel Hall Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson Door, you stand in your darkened frame, Mindful of your wooden might, Flaunting relentlessly your claim As guardian of sound and light. Yet for all your vigil, door, Shadows that slip on panting feet Over your threshold tinge the floor, with what was sunlight on the street and sounds fluttering in to die door you thought i should not know were started by an echo's cry that was a voice not long ago end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain the wind on the hills by Dora Sigerson Shorter Read for LibriVox.org By Alan Barr Go not to the hills of Erin When the night winds are about. Put up your bar and shutter, And so keep danger out. For the good folk whirl within it, And they pull you by the hand, And they push you on the shoulder, Till you move to their command. And lo, you have forgotten What you have known of tears, and you will not remember that the world goes full of years. A year there is a lifetime, and a second but a day, and an older world will meet you each morn you come away. Your wife grows old with weeping, and your children one by one grow gray with nights of watching before your dance is done. And it will chance some morning you will come home no more. Your wife sees but a withered leaf in the wind about the door, and your children will inherit the unrest of the wind, they shall seek some face elusive, and some land they never find. Where the wind is loud, they sighing, go with hearts unsatisfied, for some joy beyond remembrance, for some memory denied. And all your children's children, they cannot sleep or rest, when the wind is out in Erin, and the sun is in the west. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.